Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome founder and CEO Ennismore, Sharon Pasrisha, and founder and CEO Selena, Raphael Museri, in discussion with Skift Senior Hospitality Editor, Deanna Ting. Thanks, everyone. Um, so with me today, I have two London-based hoteliers. Um, Sean Pasrija uh, is the CEO of London-based Ennismore, whose hospitality brands include Hoxton Hotels. And Rafael Museri is the CEO and founder of Selena, a global network of spaces designed for digital nomads. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, as a little reminder to the audience, uh, please feel free to submit any questions that you may have for both Sean and Raphael uh, using slido.com or using uh, the event app. Uh, so gentlemen, this is something I like to ask all hoteliers um, and it's, it's this. What is the most memorable hotel stay to date that you have had that is not at one of your properties? Let me go first, give him sure. some time to think it through. <laughs> right. um, so it's, it's probably going to be in uh, South Africa mm -hmm. um, at a property called Singita, which mm -hmm. was one of the most magical places because they had to curate an entire experience in the middle of a forest. Uh, and, and for me, it was just so incredibly memorable walking in to uh, some of the most amazing hospitality that had to be flown in and brought in from all parts of the world. Um, and that'll stick with me forever. For me, um, I believe that there is a very, very interesting space in Tulum mm -hmm. on the beach where uh, I think it's a combination of the most simple room design, uh, very sustainable, down to earth and just feel great with an extremely high level of experience and content. And I believe that that mix when it's come with a, with a prime location just the experience and just stay with you. And uh, for me, that was the best experience in hospitality so far. Now, both of you are known for sort of reinventing and reimagining traditional hospitality concepts with your brands. Um, I wanted to ask you, how would you sort of describe the ways in which you did that? Like, what did you take about traditional hospitality and, and sort of transform or evolve with your companies? I can start. Yeah. Um, I think that overall, the way we look at hospitality is we understand that there is a new movement. Um, digital nomad is part of the movement. Remote workers, there is thousands of companies around the world that open every year. Um, companies with thousands of employees without offices today. Um, turnover of big traditional corps going high above 100% because millennials, 47% of them, claim that they want to be uh, outside of the traditional cubic or kind of urban, not flexible life. It just means that there is a very interesting opportunity to build a global infrastructure for them. For, for me, this is the way we start. So digital nomad is one of these. Remote worker is another. To be more flexible and allow people to move between different dots without the, the need to commit for X amount of days or a specific room, just to let them react based on the social experience. That's what drive, I think, us and the way we take decisions about uh, innovative hospitality. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, Dian, Hoxton's all about inspiring cultural discovery in some of the most exciting cities and neighborhoods um, that exist. We believe there's um, so much of where you stay today is reflective of who you are, and more so today than it did, say, 10 years ago. So people want to stay in places they can relate to, but they also want to stay in places that resemble a neighborhood, or they can get a sense of what it's like to be in a neighborhood or a city through the lens of a hotel. So that's really our approach. Each and every one of our hotels is really crafted from the neighborhood. It's about bringing the outside in. Um, and that's really a big part of our strategy. Um, we've differentiated, or certainly our path has been about taking control of a lot of, a lot of the experiences ourselves. So we've got a big in-house creative team of designers and furniture designers and graphic designers and digital designers to really go and reimagine the hotel experience in these unique neighbors in some of the most exciting cities. Now, one 
thing I think that both of your, your brands sort of share is um, a connection to that sort of like digital nomad lifestyle or um, the fact that you know, people work remotely, people travel all the time. Um, and I wanted to ask you, you know, do you, what do you think of co-working and co-living? Because those are two buzzwords that a lot of people in hospitality tend to throw about these days. Um, are they gimmicks or are they something more? So I truly believe that 10 years from now, every company around the world will have to allow their employees to work three to four to five to two months remotely. The, I think that the urban, people moving more towards urban spaces, but they need the remote experience. They need to go off the grid. They need to socialize. The offline socialized world is just a need. Um, if it's such an essential need, it means that you need to deliver comfortable co-work spaces. It's part of it's part of the experience. You just, uh, so for me, it's just going to be part of every good accommodation. Either it's flexible accommodation, either it's hotels. It has to be part of it. Um, digital nomads, by 2030, we're going to have 800 million of them or a billion of them. It's going to be a big amount. Mm -hmm. Those people need to be able to work and travel. That's one segment. Remote workers, it's billions. Now, they, they, they need to, I think that to work on a hammock, it's not really work. It's not really comfortable. To work in a coffee shop on a beach or in an urban place, it's not a good experience of work. To be able to work professionally and to make calls and to really drive and run technologies and coding, you need a good comfortable space. If you can combine it with a good accommodation and great experience in programming, um, it's just gonna match. There are people gonna choose it and it improves itself every year more and more. So for me, is definitely not a gimmick, is, is, is a must to have. I'd, I'd, I'd very much agree with that, but if you take a step back and you, and you think about the three largest real estate advisors to the largest companies in the world, right? So who are the three largest guys are advising the Fortune 500, the biggest companies in the world. Now, depending on who, which one of those guys you ask, they say anywhere between 10 and 30% of the companies they're advising should have flexible working or should provide offices and office space that has some element of flexible working. So if the largest real estate advisors in the world are advising the largest companies in this world that are the largest landlords in some of the biggest cities, that anywhere from 10 to 30% of their office global infrastructure should be flexible, well then the macro demands are there, right? So then it's no longer a fad. Then you couple that with changing habits of how people are using spaces. I mean, we've been in the co-working business for 10 years. We just haven't charged anyone for it, right? So our lobbies have been that space forever. And the irony is, for the first time this year, we're getting into the co-working business purely because we've got a whole range of people that kind of descend on our lobbies that have an amazing experience, but there's a whole layer of people that want to have another layer altogether. So we're kind of taking people that come to our public spaces in our ground floor and taking them into co-working spaces within the hotel. So much like Rafi said, we're having a lot of fun thinking about if Hoxton did co-working within the hotels, what would that feel like? Now, we, you know, as much as uh, we're, we're huge admirers of the folks behind WeWork and, and, and a lot of the huge co-working businesses, we're never going to be able to compete with them on scale. But guess what? We've got kitchens and engineering teams and sales teams and, and bars and restaurants within the infrastructure of our hotels. Um, I think people can have a lot more fun in those types of environments. What about co-living or sort of developing that sense of community? How, how important is that to you both in, in terms of your hospitality concepts? I think that if one of your pillars is flexibility, flexibility is important, then and digital nomads is one of the target audiences. Um, to add to a 300 square foot room, small kitchen, mm -hmm. and that can become a two month solution or six month solution, it's become a living. Um, for me, a smart algorithm that calculates ADRs per day, per week, per month, per three months, with a combination of a good F&B experiences and social life will make people start confusing a little bit between traditional hotel room and living and co-live and student accommodation. For me, it's, it's, yeah, it's a little bit bigger room. It's gonna be with kitchen, without kitchen. There is different needs. The most important thing is to understand that flexibility is it's everything. Mm -hmm. And if flexibility is everything, you need to listen to your guests every month or every day. And tech allow you to listen to the, to the clients daily. 
And if you listen to them daily and you realize that they need to stay 20 days, they're definitely not happy with uh, 150 square foot rooms, which become very popular. They will need 220 square foot room in a small kitchenette, right? So listening through tech and data and keep evolving and allowing flexibility within your spaces is the key. I look at hotels leaving as the same area. Mm -hmm. and, and retail, I mean, Deanne, I think the flexibility is the key, Rafi, because you're absolutely right. At the end of the day, the high street's changing, where you've got very clever companies that are now taking redundant spaces and offering them on the platform. You've got co-working spaces, co-living spaces. Even in the hotel industry, I think the hotel industry and hoteliers have become complacent to allow 2 p.m. check-ins. Why do you need to check in at 2 p.m.? Why can't you check in at 7 a.m.? If you're there for three hours, why can't you just stay in a hotel room for three hours? So I think the evolution is, is coming, and, and I think folks like, like us and, and, and Rafi's group have to kind of continue on that innovative path because gone are the days where I think you're going to be confined to how it used to be because mm -hmm. you've got to listen to the guest. The guest dictates how we adapt. Right. What's next beyond co-living and co-working? What's, what's the next big trend in hospitality that you see? For me, subscription. For me, the ability... The membership model? Yeah, but to, if... Again, I think that there is two things. One, uh, I think that many, many hospitality companies going just for urban or just for remote or just for secondary tourist destination, I believe that the mix is important. It's very, very important because if you, want, if you gain a trust uh, by your customer, then a customer will follow you. If you trust the experience and the fact that you're going to socialize more in your space, you're going to follow. So I think that the, the next step will be that a lot of the urban, cool lifestyle brand, as Hoxton, as many others in the industry, I think we will, I believe that we're going to experience those brands going towards more remote location and taking their guests through the experience to more places. That's one. Number two, subscription. Um, we're building 400 Selenas right now in... 45 countries in order for a person to be able to pay $1,000 a month and to travel whatever you want. If it's a desert in Morocco, if it's Moscow, if it's Costa Rica Beach, if it's Tulum, if it's the, the, the herd of London. The fact that people will pay a subscription and they will be able to travel the world, work, live, interact, socialize, I don't know, they're going to buy into it. And I think that more and more brands will go towards these directions because Again, flexibility. I, I repeat the kind of flexibility. I just believe that it's the most important pillar. We're all trying to Netflix our business model, right? <laughs> um, and, and I think it's True. incredibly clever, and I think that's where the future is. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. Um, I think it's, you, know, you just had a very successful um, funding, funding round that just passed. Thank you. Um, and um, it may, I think a lot of people are wondering, well, yeah, how are you building so many Salinas over the next couple of years? Like, what, what's sort of like the, what's the environment like in terms of growing at scale in hospitality? And what are the challenges that you're finding, especially with the types of products that you both have? First of all, if you decide to go towards rapid growth, you need to accept and live comfortably with an environment of doing mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Why? Because to go into 10 or 15 different countries, different cultures, different environment, different target audiences, just startups and rapid growth, there is a lot of changes to create a culture within the organization that allow this level of, 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 of adaptation. It's very, very important. And I think that it really depends if you're ready for that or you just want to do perfection in everything you do. You do want to be perfect, but you do need to understand that this is part of the game. Number two, is to not look at the traditional way of doing business. I think that to come to every field and to just, not as we are not coming from hospitality, it's not our background, and not me and not uh, Daniel Rudosevsky, my, my partner. We're both coming from social real estate community building uh, background. We look at the world of hospitality in our way and we think how are we gonna disrupt the way we're gonna find deals? We have to go through traditional brokers, or we can do it our way, and we just find a way to disrupt each of the layers of the development process. And I think through that, we succeed to, I think we'll, over 60 hotels uh, we secured in one year. Um, some of them open, some of them under development, and it just through looking it out of the box. Sean, I know you've taken a little bit of a more, more traditional approach to um, growing the Hoxton Hotels brand, you, you sort of own and operate and manage the properties, but you, you did tell me that you're, you're more open to sort of ex 
exploring other sort of business models for, for Yeah, them. I think uh, you know, for, for us, it, it, the journey started with wanting to control every aspect of it. So we, we owned our first property, um, tested the business model, changed things, failed miserably in a few things, tweaked things. And once we felt we perfected it, we then continued on that path. So you know, we spent a lot of capital buying real estate and, and developing and kind of building alliances and relationships. Um, phase two for us is, is as, as Rafi said, you've got to think outside the box and outside the herd to scale. So our growth is coming from third party capital, coming through asset like growth, coming through leases. I think we've got to look at it in the, in the round and, and, and think about what the risk profile is to scale. You know, scaling through asset light in urban locations is somewhat different from scaling asset light in, in non-urban locations. And I think you've got to find the right mix between doing that, especially if you're, you're looking at kind of risk profile. So we're, we're thinking unconventionally as well in terms, of, in terms of growth, but I think it's finding that right balance between the mm -hmm. two. Right. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you um, more about guest experience. So um, what do you think needs to be fixed in terms of the guest experience? And do you think technology is sort of like that easy solution or are there other ways of thinking about it? Um, first of all, I must give you a compliment, but I think that Hoxton guest experience in the common areas is one of the best in the market. And we, I just shared with him before, our executive when he came to London before we did the HU office, uh, we're staying in Hoxton and we run our corporate events there just because there is an incredible guest experience in the common spaces and we're meeting the local community. This is for us, it's what guest experience. I believe the tourists are not really excited to feel tourists. They want to feel, they want to interact with the local. And if I'm coming to, uh, to Shoreditch, I want to feel Shoreditch. And if the Shoreditch local community interact within a space, so for me, guest experience number one is to interact with the local community in a very authentic way, not in a fake way. That's number one. Um, number two is for me, if people are gonna shift the way they look at rooms, if you're gonna say, I'm first gonna create an incredible experience in my common area, and then if that's gonna be perfect, rooms will be occupied. Versus, and then I'm selling experiences and I'm not selling rooms. Versus I'm gonna sell rooms, oh, we have a common area, let's see how we're gonna make it cool. You will not make it cool because it's not gonna become the DNA of your company. It's about the DNA, and if the DNA is experience, and you're gonna focus on that, and most of your key people in the organization will be focused on creating experience and make people socialize, rooms will be occupied organically without fighting on revenue management in traditional ways to look at hospitality. This is, for me, is the, the guest experience, how important is it? And I, I, I mean, we, I'm a huge fan of, of, of Celine, and, and, and Rafi knows that, for, for me, uh, you know, the, the, the ground floor is, is the heartbeat of a hotel, right? We spend an awful amount of time, painful amount of time, really understanding our guests and our customers. And, you know, there's good reason why the reception desk is always tucked away in the corner and it doesn't feel like a hotel lobby. So we've really spent a lot of time thinking about how do we become that neighborhood town hall? How do we become that neighborhood living room that kind of brings the best of the outside in? So I think, you know, our teams do an amazing job, I think, to, to kind of, you know, constantly challenge things, and especially in cities at times which do not... Culturally, you're not used to going to hotels. So when we open in Paris or Amsterdam, both the Dutch and French are not used to going to hotels to have a cup of coffee as they would if they live around the corner or have a glass of wine. And that's been a cultural shift. So, you know, there's definitely hairy moments where we, we thought, shit, what if they don't come and nobody turns up? But, you know, it's, it's, it's true. If you create a great product, people will come. You know, your question was what, what I think, what, what's broken and what I think needs fixing. I think mean, sometimes I'm amazed as a hotelier um, and all our hotels run at 90 plus occupancy, how we do that without really knowing enough about our guests. And I think we're sandwiched between a lot of archaic systems and kind of legacy systems and industry systems. And frankly, you know, five, six years ago when we were innovating and disrupting, we were bringing on creatives to kind of control the creative journey. Today I'm hiring software engineers and, and, and really having to think how I can rebuild the technology journey from a guest experience perspective because if I simply leave it to the incumbent industry technologies that exist, 10 years will go by and the truth is I won't know nothing about my guests. So we're now really, uh, you know, growth for us and disruption and innovation for us is coming through tech to really understand the guest experience. And, you know, our research shows us our guests will gladly share information with us as long as we did something about it. And, and you know, our teams do an amazing job to surprise and delight our guests, but without that, ha you know, without really having technology as a, as a kind of facilitator to do that. So I think over the next five years, um, we're spending a lot of time on, on building technologies. Rafael, do you have anything to add about technology in, in Selena? 
Um, it's our biggest department by far. Mm -hmm. um, we have over 70 programmers full time uh, trying to build tools to gather data. Um, I believe that the only way to enable rapid growth is through tech, and that's what we're focusing. Our growth is measured through data, and that's how we can control um, over 100 people that are looking for deals around the world in 20 countries in different towns. And, and so it's just through a very good tech control. For me, the same about the conversion process, same about the guest experience. You can, today you have sensors that you can measure if people are happy in your space, if they're really happy, if they integrate. I believe that, that tech will allow us to understand on scale what's going on with our guests and to be able to take decisions and to adapt ourselves. I, I, when I was doing the research for this, I, I noticed a lot of sort of connecting threads between both of your brands. Um, it was really the emphasis on community, um, sort of like the flexibility, uh, really sort of knowing what guests want. Um, but one, one other connecting thread that I found was that you both sort of emphasize relative affordability for both of your brands, your main brands. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, why emphasize that? And is it actually possible to deliver and turn good profits or margins when you have that sort of mindset in terms of the pricing? I think, first of all, when you're a long-term viewer than the specific one unit economics, it is very important. But if you look at the bigger picture and you're following a new movement and you build a solution for a movement, then you need to think long-term. And I believe that, um, I believe that the, 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 the customer that all he has is $25 for bed and $10 for food and beverage for the day, and all he has to spend is $35. He's as interesting guy, which I really want to interact with, and I really want to have a conversation in my space. Then, again, we have, in the same building, $20 a bed and $500 rooms. Doors look the same. The people that walk out of the doors look the same. It's a full democratic approach of accommodation. Why? Every coffee shop, every cinema, every club, every bar, that's what you experience. You have a very interesting social mix of people. Why to not bring this social mix of people into the hotels area? There is no reason, uh, again, and that's one of the things that we're not coming for hospitality, so we, we look at it in a different way. I want all of them to interact. Interesting people, why not? I don't care what their financial background. And for me, uh, for me, that's what it's all about. Yeah, you can have, if you want a $500 room, it's possible. If you want a $20 bed, it's possible. Let's interact, make friends, and, and, and smile. That's what it's all about. It's, 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 it's a great point. I think historically you were defined by uh, the size of your wallet or your bank balance. Today you're defined by what interests you and what brings you together in terms of interest. Um, you know, we have Glen Eagles as part of our business, and you know, that's a, firmly a luxury hotel, but luxury even there has changed. You know, no longer is luxury about white tablecloths and silver service. You could still sit in a beautiful space, enjoy a $30 glass of wine if that was your bag, but you don't have to feel stuffy and you don't need to be in an environment that was once you know, 50 years ago. So I think the you know, consumer habits are changing and I love this intersection of being a lot more democratic. I mean, at Hoxton, we hate reserve signs. We hate having to, to, to kind of choose between types of people. You'll never find a, a red rope outside and VIP signs. It is a very democratic process. And I think that, you know, as Rafi called it, as part of this movement, that's what's quite exciting about brands like ours who are kind of bucking the trend um, for growth. And sort of keeping with the theme of uh, our forum, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, if you ever worry about contributing to gentrification or over-tourism with some of your, your properties and projects, um, and, you know, do you think that there are ways that the hospitality industry really can be stewards of responsible travel? I think, you know, I think the industry has shifted, you know, significantly over the last couple of years. And, and, and it's interesting, when I conduct interviews today, some of the younger folks that I'm interviewing are actually interviewing me to ask me about our sustainable policy. How do we, as a hotel, how we be socially responsible in some of the neighborhoods we come in? Our suppliers are asking that. So I think no longer is it a sort of CSR tagline on the bottom of a website. You've got to live and breathe your values. So, you know, our journey in these neighborhoods starts 
you know, at a plot of land or when there's an existing derelict building. So our sort of looking at world sustainability and kind of community development starts at an incredibly early age. Because nine times out of 10, we own the real estate, means we've got to know our neighbors. We have a vested interest in what's happening there. But look, outside of, you know, a lot of the obvious things that have shifted in the industry around plastics and sustainable, you know, um, uh, building, you've, you know, you've got to move with the trends. And, you know, today's guests and, you know, people that work for us are absolutely on point and they're pushing brands to say, well, what is your point of view? No longer can you not have a point of view. You have to have a point of view as a brand. Um, I agree 100%. I believe that, um, I think that the way uh, we look at the sustainability, it's about, first of all, by trying to choose existing spaces and try to reduce a little bit the construction side of it. Number two, I think uh, I can surprise a lot of people that when you are, we're upcycling 75% of our inventory of existing hotels and guests uh, appreciating a side table that we invest $5 to upcycle it versus $150 to buy a new one, uh, people appreciate it more and they, they take picture and they like it. So I think there is many, many ways, disruptive ways to, to, to be sustainable and to impact. And, and I think that each brand based on their growth strategy need to adapt themselves to see how they can do best and, but I can definitely say that our target audiences really care about it. They ask the questions, they're involved, they want to be sure that the impact is not just, uh, just another, uh, another pillar or one, 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 one more line in your brand book. They really want to be sure that it's authentic and it's real, and that's the only way to go. Um, the last question for me is, you know, in an increasingly consolidated industry like the hotel industry, um, what's the eventual fate of innovative brands and companies like yours? Is it, you know, is it your hope that, that someone like IHG snaps you up or do you want to continue to still be independent, to continue to innovate, to disrupt? Um, we want to continue to innovate, to disrupt. It's fun. It's... I think that to look at this world of travelers, how it's shifting, and it's just the most crazy shift I think uh, um, happened the last 40 or 50 years, and to be part of that and, and to design it, and for me to open in the same week location in New York and in a small town in, in Ecuador on the Amazonas and to see how people interact in both spaces, and I think that the, 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 the only way to go is with your own passion and drive, and that's the way uh, I want forever to keep disrupting this area. It's just interesting. Sean? I'm waiting for SoftBank to call me and give me $10 billion. <laughs> okay. um, uh, look, I think, I think as, as, as true entrepreneurs, the, the ability, our ability to create what we create is, 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 is only because we're fiercely independent, one, and two, uh, we're not confined by a box, right? I guess n neither of us have come from the world of hotels, so I don't have the Cornell handshake and I don't know how things should be done. Um, and that allows you to kind of want to fail fast and, and kind of understand what, what you can do and do better. Um, and I think that's quite an exciting, uh, ex exciting realm to be. So as long as we remain fiercely independent, of course you need access to capital. So convincing, you know, institutional investors that our journey, which is, you know, still metric on, you know, revenue per available room, metric on, on revenue, on, on EBITDA per square foot. You know, we're really going deep in terms of understanding our metrics, and I believe, you know, we're best in class at it, but we're just approaching it very, very differently. And, and one more thing to add, I think that, the, that the, there is no, again, it's, it's not easy to, to, to be entrepreneurs and to be founders, but I think that one of the, the best fun part of it is to try something new and people actually consume it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an incredible feel. And, and I think that this is the power that drive entrepreneurs and, and founders in every area. So mm -hmm. I think that that's what drives us. I think we have time for one audience question. And I'm going to ask one that sort of ties into this question, which is, do you see the big chains creating new brands that are designed to directly compete in your space? And would they be a threat to you? I think they're they doing it every week, aren't they? It <laughs> seems to be a new brand every week. <laughs> I, I think that um, culture, it's something that you can't change in a day. Mm -hmm. I think the disruptive movement that's starting bottom up with young groups around the world, there's incredible groups in Latin America, in Asia, Europe, US, that's starting new brands. I think that they're gonna lead the change. 
I do believe that the traditional brands are out there for so long, which, yeah, I'm definitely sure that they're going to keep shifting, but I think there is something very authentic, which is bottom up, that when that starts, we can't compete. And again, I'm saying over for us, I'm sure that five years from now, you're going to have brands that are going to grow. We're going to look and say, wow, they're cooler, they're nicer. They're... It's just happening is the, is the natural thing of doing business. So I'm def it's happening every week, I agree, and I definitely feel very comfortable in that space. So I lied. I'm going to ask one more. <laughs> um, so this one relates to sort of co co-working. So Hoxton's lobbies in London often appear to have more co-workers than guests in them. Do you worry about the Raffi and his team, that's the problem. That's, that's true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. We debate this a lot as a team, and the truth is, Imagine walking into the lobby and not having those co-workers, and that's a, that's a, that's a very difficult problem and a different problem to have. Um, it, it's, it's a funny evolution, and we've, we've got this amazing relationship with a lot of the, lot of the co-workers that come and hang out. Some of them are even so respectful that they leave at 11 o'clock, allow us to sell the table for lunch, and then come back at 2. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I, I think it's great. I think as long as there's a mutual respect, nobody's taking the piss, we call it the hustle. We love the hustle in there, and it's not, it's not an anti-social co-working, right? It's not always people with headphones and hipster beards and IMAX. They're people having conversations. And yeah, some people hang out and have a glass of water for two hours. We don't mind. Some people come and enjoy the free Wi-Fi. We don't mind. But equally, you know, people are attracted to that space because of that hustle, and we enjoy it. And with that new co-working business coming out soon, you'll find a way to monetize it a little bit well, more? Well, it's a whole different floor. So we've got seven floors in Southwark of co-working spaces where it's, it's, it's a sort of hustle on steroids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rafi, anything that you wanted to add with regard to co-working and the impact on paying guests' experiences? I think that people attract people, and offline exper online experience is growing every day, and of course, we like the fact that online experience is improving because it's enabled us to be better through data, but at the same time, um, all, again, 47% feel lonely in the world, all they want is interaction. So value of people in a space is much more than the cup of coffee or the glass of wine that they drink. It's all about energy. And if a space has energy, the space will drive revenue in different ways. But you don't have to buy through the F&B average daily or there is, again, brands have value by, by creating energy and make people interact. I think that that's the value of space. So. I think that's a great note to end our conversation with. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Thank you.